5, verse 15. We'll continue our message on sin's remedy. Let me remind you, if you've never signed up for our eternal broadcasting book of the month, which what we do is we provide these books every month to those who support eternal broadcasting, love gifts of any size. Uh, this month's book is Seeking Christ in Christmas. Talking about the wise men, it's a, a really extensive study on the Magi and a lot of things about the Magi people don't know. No one was ever made king in the old world unless the Magi crowned them. And the Magi crowned Jesus. Amen? And so he's definitely going to be king of kings and lord of lords. It's a workbook in the back. You've got questions and answers to help you study and, and to go through it. It's a good Bible study for you and your family. If you haven't signed up, see Big Boy. Wave at him, Big Boy. That's Big Boy. And uh, he'll sign you up, and we'll give you the first one free. Just sign up, and he'll give you one. And every month we'll get to make sure you get a copy of that. But this month's especially good at Christmas time about the Magi. It's a great story. The Bible's clear there's a remedy for sin. Last week we talked about the fact that everyone has sinned, for sin upon has passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And there has to be a reason for the separation between God and man, and that reason was sin. Secondly, we saw Sunday night, every sin uh, has to have its penalty paid. There has to be a recompense, a debt, for the payment of sin. Now this morning we'll look at point number three. Every sin has to be paid for personally. There has to be a res- has to be responsibility, individual, personal responsibility. You can't get saved for somebody else, and somebody else can't get saved for you. Doesn't work that way. You personally have to come to Christ. Jesus died for our sins personally on the cross, and personally you have to accept Him. Romans chapter 5 verse 15 says, But not as the offense, so also is the free what? Aren't you glad salvation's a gift? You didn't have to die for your sins. You did not have to lay down your life for your sins. You did not have to pay your own debt. He paid it for you. Then it says, For if through the offense of one, that one was Adam, many be dead, that's all of us, much more the grace of God, the strength of God, the salvation of God, and the gift of by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto how many? (laughs) Well, many. (laughs) Many. Aren't you glad you're saved this morning? Aren't you glad to be one of many? And I'm glad there can be many more saved. That's why we're working so hard this holiday season. Well, we had so many visitors here last night. I think we had more visitors here last night than we had people that are members of the church. Well, it was great having visitors here. People come in. There'll be visitors this week, next week. People come at the door. What's our goal? To introduce them to Jesus. Amen? That they might be saved and be part of many. Verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification, just as if you never sinned. When God looks down from heaven at me and you, he doesn't see us in our vile flesh or our sinful state. He sees us as his children, washed in the blood, forgiven, and just as if we'd never sinned. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, death's a horrible thing. Death's a horrible thing. We went this week and we laid Brother Kenny's daddy to rest here on Friday. Death's a horrible thing. But one and one will die. It's guaranteed. Unless the Lord returns, we're all going to face that one day. The old grim weeper of death. Because Adam sinned, the whole race was plunged into death. Death reigned by one much more. They received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness to reign by the life by one, Jesus Christ. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. I'm glad that many can be saved. I'm glad that any can be saved. Amen? It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or where you've been. You can be born again. You can be saved. I don't care what you've done, how you live. He'll save your soul. The abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, it only comes one way. By Jesus. 
Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's the only way you can be saved. can't work your way to heaven. You can join every church in America and still die and go to hell. You can be baptized in every creek, pond, and baptistry there is and still die and go to hell. That's not what saves you. What saves you is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Coming to him, accepting him. Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift of salvation, came upon all men unto justification not only of our sins, but justification of life. It's heartbreaking standing over that grave on Friday. Our loved one had gone. He's left us. But you know what kept us from falling apart? He's not gone forever. He's just gone to heaven. Amen? He knew the Lord. He was saved. He was born again. They didn't have to worry about where he was. He was in heaven. He was rejoicing. He's not in a wheelchair anymore. He's running all over heaven. Amen? That's what salvation does. For That's our hope. That's our joy. That's our peace. Is that hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. And then verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one many shall be made righteous. Can I give you a new twist on that last phrase? When you first read that, you think it's talking about Jesus, but it's not talking about Jesus. For by the obedience of one, that could be Jesus, but I think it's me and you. If we just as an individual will yield to God and obey God and live for God because of what Jesus did for me and you, we can help lead many other people to Jesus Christ as well. Don't you believe that this morning? I do. I believe with all my heart I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't waste my time. I wouldn't waste my life if I didn't believe that was the most important thing in life is seeing other people come to Christ and be made righteous. Many, not a few. We got a great job to do, a great work to do as a church, as a body, as the children of God. You see, we must personally and individually accept Christ as our personal Savior to be saved. The Mormons believe you can go and be baptized in the Mormon tabernacle out in Salt Lake City for somebody else, and you can baptize him into heaven. That's a perverted lie. You cannot be saved for somebody else. You cannot take somebody else's place. You personally, for yourself, must be born again. You see, the rich man was in hell and Lazarus was in paradise. One could not go to where the other was. There was a separation there that could not be crossed because Lazarus was saved and the rich man was lost. Lazarus was a child of God. The rich man was not. It's a difference. Once you're there, you're there. That's why we've got to win people to Christ before they die. There is no, no other opportunity after death. The rich man knew he could not go back. He knew he could not warn his brethren. He said, let me go back and tell my five brethren. He said, they've got the prophets. If they'll not listen to them, they'll not listen to you, even though you come back from the dead. There was a man in hell who was worried about being a soul winner. But Christians today have lost that zeal. That fervor to save souls and see lives change. We've got to get it back. Amen? We've got to get that fervor back. Personally, Jesus was qualified to be Savior. He was qualified. Verse, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says why Jesus himself personally was qualified to be the Savior. That's the story, the Christmas story. Jesus was born of a virgin. Amen? His father was the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 4.15 for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, he understands what we're going through. He was in the flesh. He lived in this world just like we did. He put up with the same elements we put up with. He understands that. He said, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, three words, yet without what? Jesus Christ is the only one on earth who never sinned. The only one. And that's why he's qualified to be the Savior. That's why he's qualified to be Lord. That's why he's qualified to pay my sin debt and yours. He can do for me what I could not do for myself. 
There was no one else who would ever be able to qualify to be Savior. He was born of a virgin. His father was the Holy Ghost. He lived and died as a man. He resisted the temptations and tests of the devil in the wilderness. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says, And ye know that he was what? Made visible to take away, or made manifest in the flesh, to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. These people who try to say Jesus Christ was just another man or just another prophet, they are wrong. He was the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's why we revel in that this Christmas. That's why we're so thankful the Father sent the Son. We're so grateful today that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. B, not only is He personally qualified, But Jesus personally suffered as a sacrifice. He personally suffered as a sacrifice. Hebrews 9.26 For then must he often have what? Suffered. Folks, you and I don't know what suffering is. So you've been beaten beyond recognition of a man. But that's not even the worst of the suffering. The worst of the suffering was For the first time in all of history, Jesus and the Father had something come between them. Have you ever loved somebody so much that you had a quarrel and liked to kill you until you got it right? Y'all are lying crowd this morning. That's all I'll tell you. You have. You have. Just couldn't wait till you got it back and made it right. Just eat at you because you didn't want anything between you and that person. I'll never forget my... Grandma on my daddy's side, and my aunt, my daddy's sister, I was spending the weekend, and they got in a hellacious fight about something. I don't know what it was, but you don't get to between two women when they're fighting. You don't do that. I went on back to bed and said, I can eat any time. I can also die any time, amen? I said, I ain't getting between my mom and Gladys about nothing. So I went and got back into bed until they got through. And then I heard it all calm down, and so I sneaked out to bed, and my mom had breakfast on the table, and Gladys come through. And if I live to be a thousand, I'll never forget it. Gladys was getting ready to leave, goes when my mom grabbed her and hugged her and said, I love you, and I don't want nothing between me and you. Forgive me for being ugly. And they made right up right there in the kitchen. And I said, Phew, now I might get a second of helping up breakfast. Say amen or amen. There's peace in the camp. Amen. Thank God for peace. Mama said after Gladys left, she says, I couldn't leave and have her on the road thinking she was mad with me. Or I was mad with her. Hey, that's wisdom. Amen. For the first time in all history, there was something between God the Father and God the Son. And it was your sins. And it was my sins. Broke their fellowship. That was probably more painful for Jesus than any physical suffering that he ever suffered. Jesus was personally a sacrifice. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world this was set. But now, uh, once in the end of the world, hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He gave his life for you. Nobody forced him. He laid down on that cross. He stretched his hands out. He gave his life. Prove it, preacher. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He gave his life. He did not have to die for you. He did not have to die for me. But he suffered the pain and the agony because God said without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And Jesus was determined to die for you. Greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. Amen? Jesus personally, physically, painfully died on the cross for man's sin. Genesis 22, 7 says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, this is prophetic. 
God will provide, what's that pronoun? Himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. We know for them it meant there was going to be a ram caught in the thicket. I said, I always had a hard time with that as a kid. I said, the Bible says the Lamb of God, not the Ram of God. Until I got educated and found out, what's a male lamb? A ram. <laughs> I found out what one was. And so they had to learn a little something. But the ram was caught in the thicket and took Isaac's place. Jesus took our place. He died for us. God provided himself as the lamb. That's right. Us. He died. God died for us. Oh, listen. Abraham told Isaac that profound truth, and it came to pass, and so did Jesus come to pass. God sent part of himself and his only begotten son to sacrifice himself for man's soul. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. For then must he have often what? Suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Himself. If he sacrificed himself, what must meet we do? We've got to sacrifice ourselves. I love Christmas time because I watch people make sacrifices for church. They'll go the extra mile for the kids' party. They'll go the extra mile for the cantata. They'll go the extra mile for the kids' play. They'll go the extra mile for the angel tree. They sacrifice time, talent, and treasure to get out the message of the gospel, the love of Christ. Folks, we need to sacrifice, don't we? We need to show Him and sacrifice. He didn't ask us to die. He asked us to live. Our sacrifice is a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Hebrews 10.12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. When Jesus got done, he was finished, folks. It's not grace plus works. Mm -mm. It's grace because we need to work. It's grace so we can work. Works don't save us. Not by the works of righteousness we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. His personal suffering. He personally suffered as a sacrifice for me and you. Then see, He personally condemned the law of sin. You know, laws are hard to keep up with. They change with the wind, don't they? The government changes his mind all the time. But law is over us and we've got to follow it or we'll go to the Hushka. Anybody want to go to Hushka? No. I ain't interested in going to Hushka. I don't want to go to jail. I like being free. Amen? So you want to be free, you've got to obey the law. If you don't, if you don't, guess who's going to come get you? Barney Fife. Citizens arrest! Citizens arrest! He's going to get you. Sin's going to chase you. Say amen or oh me. The law could not erase sin. It only points out our sin. It was the blood that erased it. The law points it out. This makes us see that we need him. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 3, For what the law could not what? Do. The law could not save you. It could not save me. It could not change our lives. It could only point out we need. It could only diagnose the problem. Jesus is the cure. Amen? The blood's the cure. It can only point out that we were guilty and we were convicted of sin. Jesus was in the likeness of sinful flesh, but yet without sin. Because he was perfect. He was the son of God. And Jesus paid for man's sin and not only erased our sin, but he forgave us, but he tore up the law against us and removed the penalty. When we get to heaven, the law is going to say that every one of us ought to go to hell. But Jesus is going to stand up and say, no, I remember a time many, many moons ago when Sean Horbett jumped three people in a pew in a church and run to the altar and asked God to save him. And asked me to forgive him. And I did, and he's mine. The law got nothing to do with it. 
because he's been covered by the blood. Amen? Thank God. I remember a day when I was a little boy, seven years old. Preacher preached against sin. I knew I was a thief. I was seven years old and I was convicted under the law of being a thief. Because my mama said, don't you get them cookies out that jar. And she turned her back and I took every one I could get. I was a thief. I knew I'd done wrong. I knew I was going to hell. The law had condemned me. But T.W. Reiner took me in the back room. Sit in an old metal chair. Open the Bible to Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.9. Showed me those scriptures. And we knelt down on an old tile floor. And I called out on Jesus to forgive me for my sins. And when I stand before God one day, God's going to, Jesus Christ is going to recount the very same thing that happened to me that day. He's going to say, the devil can't have him. He's mine. Ah, oh, I'm glad he's mine and I'm his. Amen? He personally suffered. He paid my sin. To, and he's going to condemn the law that's against me because the blood has been applied. Jesus became a man to redeem man. Oh, God took himself to take man's place. His sinlessness gave him the power over sin we don't have. And nor could we ever have. And he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he rose up on the third day. And he's coming back. Say amen. His sinlessness gave him that power. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. Look at this screen. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me what? Free from the law of sin and death. Hey, the law is no longer against me. I'm heaven bound with a hammer down. And the devil can't stop me. Amen? He might trip me. He might hinder me. He might halt me. But he ain't going to stop me from going to heaven. Because the blood has been applied. Acts chapter 8 verse 18. And when Simon saw... That through the laying on hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given. He, Simon the sorcerer, the devil worshiper, offered them what? You cannot buy your way to heaven. Saying, give me also this what? See, he wanted the power that only Jesus had. He thought he could buy the power of God. You can't buy the power of God. It's a free gift to those who yield themselves to Christ. That whomsoever I lay hands on, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent ye therefore of thy what? Thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, listen to this, and in the bond of what? Before you're saved, you're bound by sin, bound by the law of sin, bound by the chains of sin. And there's only one thing that can break the bonds of sin, and that's the blood of Jesus. Peter said, Simon, you're a devil worshiper. You're power hungry. All you want is power. You don't want the Savior. You just want His power, and you're going to hell, buddy. And you better hope somehow you find out you're going there and get saved before you get there. Say amen. That's what he said. He said, you're in the bonds of iniquity. 2 Peter 2.18, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity or selfishness, and they are lured through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, that's the desire for empty things. Those that were clean escape from them that live in error. While they promote them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcoming of the same is he, what? Brought in bondage. Religion is bondage. When they teach you, you can work your way to heaven, buy your way to heaven, get baptized your way to heaven, join the church to heaven, they're putting you back under bondage and sentencing you to hell that you've always been sentenced to. There's only one way out of hell. There's only one way to heaven. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that can break the bonds of sin. Hebrews 2.14 says, For as much as the children partake of flesh and blood, he likewise of himself took part of the same, that through what? Death. He died. He might destroy him that hath the power of what? The only thing the devil has power is death. That's why the devil signs a skull. Death. Rotten flesh off a skull. Death. The only thing the devil's got to offer you is death. But Jesus can offer you what? 
life and life more abundantly and to deliver them from the fear of death where we're all of their lifetime subject to bondage. You know what we're all afraid of? Dying. We're all afraid of dying. Dying's not in our genes. We don't want to die. We don't want to face death. I don't want to die. I'm praying for the rapture quick. Fast. Come on, Jesus. I'm ready to go. Every time I shake the undertaker's hand, he says, give two fingers up on my pulse, see how much longer it's going to be before he gets me. I'm not interested in dying. I want to live. But the devil is the author of death. But Jesus is the author of life. So I got on the spot where the glory comes out. I got washed in the blood. And I may die physically, but I'm never going to die spiritually. And I'm going to come back to life physically sooner or later. And God's going to put me back together, hold, take me to heaven as one. Say amen. So shall I ever be with the Lord. I'm looking forward to that. I've buried grandmas. I've buried granddaddies. I've buried aunts. I've buried uncles. I've buried church members. Thank God one day, every last one of them that knew Jesus coming up out of that ground. And I'm going to see him again in heaven. I used to hear my uncle say, I know more people dead and I do alive and I thought you're crazy. I'm 53 years old, man, and I know more people dead than I do alive. More people gone than more people I know. That's the way life is. But aren't you glad God made a way? The death can't destroy our friendships and our fellowships and our families. He, Romans 8, 20 says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that hath subject in the same hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from bondage or corruption into the glorious, what? Liberty of the children of God. Death's coming my way, but that's okay. Problems are coming my way, but that's okay. If God be for me, and be against me. Nobody. Then D. Personally, he redeemed the sinner. Second Corinthians five twenty one. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the what? Of God. Through him. You can see me as old fat sinner if you want to, but when Jesus looks at me, he sees a child of his. He don't look my hair's all messed up. He don't look my suits a little tight. He don't, he don't look at me in the negative light. He looks down through the blood of Jesus and he says, that's my child. He believed in my son. He chose, my, he chose me and my son. And those who choose us, we choose them. And folks, I'm glad of that, aren't you? I mean... I'm telling you, I've seen some mamas and daddies birth some ugly children in this world. And they'll take that ugly little baby and they'll cry over that, oh, ain't that the prettiest thing you ever seen? I thought, good night, look at that ugly baby. And then I look at mom and daddy and say, that's where they got it from. <laughs> but they look at that baby, they don't see the ugly. They don't see the wrinkles, the redness. They don't see the cone head. Come on, we're getting serious here now. That baby's ugly. That thing's head's a cone. It just got born. All they know is that's their what? That's their baby. That's their child. And they love that baby. And they love that child. You know, that's how God looks at me and you. It don't matter. When he comes and gets us, he's going to fix us up. Say amen or oh man. He's going to fix us up. He's going to make us okay. When we're saved, we're in Christ. There's 78 verses in the New Testament referring to us as in Christ. When sin is removed, we become a part of the body of Christ. Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely through his grace, we have what? We have redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redeemed. I'm looking forward to that redemption. Do you have that redemption? Are you in Christ? Has there ever been a time that you chose him so that when the time comes at the judgment seat, he can choose you? Because if you don't choose him, you're not going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be at the great white throne. And there's no hope for the body at the great white throne. You're there to be condemned by the law. Everybody that stands before the great white throne, the law will condemn them 
to hell. But everybody at the judgment seat of Christ, they're there because they come up in the rapture because they were what? In Christ. They're a part of Him. And you'll stand before God and the books will be open and Jesus will say, "Uh uh-uh, don't you say nothing bad. That's my child. Now look, I can say what I want to about Jason. He's mine. But you better not put your big fat mouth on him. I'll bust you. Try me. He's mine. I can say ugly. Wendy can say ugly. But you ain't saying no ugly about my child. And you know what? When we stand before God in heaven, no one, ha, no one's going to say nothing ugly about me and you who've been saved. You know, there's a whole lot of bad things to be said about Mike Tickle. A whole lot of bad stories could be told. Come on, give me that face, Larry Tickle face. That's it, he give it to me. But you know what? Nobody's ever going to hear them in heaven. Say amen, Mike. Hey, I can speak up and say, but you know it, and God's going to shut up, Walter. We're in heaven. You don't reign here. You don't reign here. You don't rule here. The blood rules here. Amen? A whole lot of bad things Pam could tell on Julius. Lord, help us. Amen. But you know God's going to look at Pam and say, Shut up, Pam. We're in heaven. <laughs> no, no, fortunately. No. <laughs> we'll talk out to church. <laughs> but the blood rules in heaven. Nobody's ever going to hear a bad thing about it. Ed Neural threatened me this morning. Y'all believe Ed Neural threatened me? In Sunday school. I, I was talking, she says, I could tell a whole lot on you. I thought, I hope she's quiet. I said, Lord, help her be like Jesus. Help her forget all that I done done, all the secret things I don't want nobody to know. And so far she ain't said nothing. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Ed <laughs> Why? Hey, in heaven, the blood reigns. I'm tickled. How about y'all? That's a bad word to use, but I'm tickled. And I'm going to heaven. And nobody's ever going to know the bad things I've done. Because they're under the blood. They're under the blood. Are your sins personally paid for by the sacrifice of his blood. Every head's about, every eye's closed.